They did. They, I mean, they did try and tell us. Your parents or teachers or your youth group sponsor, Sunday school teacher, your basketball coach, your crazy uncle, somebody tried to tell you. At some point, they did. I mean, we cried, we whined, we stomped our feet, we occasionally made a scene in public. We had one complaint about the whole world, as far as we knew it. Our world consisted of Legos, Star Wars action figures, not dolls, action figures, <laughs> or for some of you, Barbies. Crayons, Saturday morning cartoons. We had, we had one complaint about the world as far as we knew it. And that one complaint about the world as far as we knew it. It's not fair. We, all of us cried that out, probably some point at Walmart, at one point in our lives. Somebody takes the toy that we were playing with it's not fair. Somebody gets a gold star in class that we wanted. Not fair. Everybody else in my entire school is wearing this and I'm wearing the knockoff Walmart brand. It's not fair. Mom's spending all her time with the new baby. Teresa. <laughs> True story. I don't remember this, of course. Newborn me comes home from the hospital. Little two-year-old Teresa throws her toys all over her room. Not happy. It's not fair. This one complaint basically summed up everything, everything that we thought was wrong with the world. And ever since we were, we were children, we had this instinct that the world wasn't quite everything it was supposed to be. I remember when that happened for me, one of my earliest memories. I was about five or six and we lived in this little ranch house that had a mostly finished basement, kind of a family room place down there, people watching TV, and everybody's watching TV downstairs, and I want to go downstairs, and there are 14 steps. I know there are 14 steps because I fell down them many times. <laughs> From the ground floor to the basement, and I was going down the steps, and I tripped and fell and landed at the bottom of the stairs, breaking my right arm, one of my earliest memories is lying on the floor of the basement, broken arm, crying out, why didn't anyone catch me? <laughs> I don't know why I thought that somehow my parents were superheroes. You know, mild-mannered college math professor and bank accountant by day, crime fighters and saviors of clumsy children at night. I don't know how that all worked. I, it, it was patently unfair in my mind, five or six-year-old me, that upon hearing me stumble down the stairs, they didn't rush right over at supersonic speed and catch me, thus saving me. But they did try to tell me, and they did try to tell you. Over and over, they did. Somebody at some point in your life said this to you. Life isn't fair. I'm not sure we ever really got that message. Because I think, you know, if actually if we kind of look at ourselves and look at our world and look at things as far as we understand them, we kind of sort of just have the same complaint that we did when we were kids. Right? Somebody else gets the internship, the ministry opportunity that you wanted. Not fair. Roommates driving a brand new car. I'm driving something that was built in the late 1980s. Not fair. No matter how hard I tried, DeFazio won't give me higher than a B on my paper. Not fair. Chris Dewell kicked somebody else's chair in class, not mine. Because <laughs> there are blessings that come with that, my friends. It seems as though God has spoken so clearly to everyone around me, and I'm on my fourth major in two and a half years. It's not fair. We never really grew up. All this time, our one main complaint just kind of stayed the same. The world, as far as we know it, just isn't fair. And for all of us, there's good news. God isn't fair either. 
we've been doing something these past few weeks I think is either really bold or really foolish. And maybe it's a little bit of both. We've been, de- we've been trying to define God. Which is just, I mean, you're going to fail. You, you, you can't possibly succeed to something that immense, that remarkable, that I don't have words to describe what, why we can't have words to describe God. The very thing, the one thing that I hope that all of you gain from these messages is how flimsy these words are when trying to encompass, try to get your arms around the majesty, the glory that is God. I mean, how can we get our arms around the one who transcends space and time and even reality when at some point, I mean, you even really shouldn't say that God exists because that puts God in the wrong category of things that exist and God defines existence. God isn't dependent on existence. And it's like, stop. <laughs> we find ourselves, this series, one last attempt. I don't know if I'm going to do any better. To try to define God. And the word for us today is God is just. So you ever have, have a Bible? Open to Isaiah 59. If you have a Bible or an approved electronic device, find Isaiah 59, because all these words we realize have problems. All the words, the problem is we bring all this baggage to the word. We have this conception of what God should be, and so we put that on him. And we do that with this word too. I mean, we say we want justice. We cry out for justice. We go to social media and we do hashtag activism in order to raise awareness for justice. But what do we actually mean? See, I fear that most of the time, most of the time when we say justice, what we actually mean is fairness. And we define fairness depending on what we want, our sense of right and wrong. We might have the best intentions in the world, but if we're defining justice on God by means of our, what we think is fair, then that's just going to fail. That our view of justice is as small as our understanding of the world as it really is the world under the sovereignty of God, under his Glory. So, if you think that justice purely means that everybody should have the same opportunity, if you think that justice merely means that everybody should live free from pain, if you think that justice is just that everybody who does wrong should be penalized in proportion to the crime that they commit, then you're not thinking of justice. At least you're not thinking of it the way God defines it. You're thinking of fairness. You're thinking of the world the way you want it to be. And even if you have, as I said, the best intentions in the world, your definition is just too small. And here's why. Remember last week? Your definition is too small because it removes the presence, the nearness of God. God defines justice by his presence. We often use the image of a courtroom with God, right? I've done this, other people have done this. We we often use that metaphor for God. Well, I don't know how many times you've been in a courtroom. I've been in, let's say, a few times. A few, just a few, not many. But for my limited time in courtrooms, I've never yet had an experience where the judge wanted to have any kind of relationship with me. I've never had any kind of experience where the judge actually wanted to get to know me. Well, before I decide your guilt and innocence about this one thing, you're driving too fast, but uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. That never happens. There's no judge out there that wants to actually form some kind of relationship. There's no room for reconciliation in the courtroom. It's just about making those kinds of 
judgments. There's no even room for forgiveness in a courtroom because forgiveness only happens in relationship. God is a judge, but he's unlike any judge you know or ever seen. Not like Judge Judy at all. (laughs) Sorry, Mom. The courtroom is a picture of isolation. The courtroom is a picture of distinction. The judge is up here and you are down there. God's justice is a picture of transformation and a picture of reconciliation. A picture of relationship restored. Of isolated people come back home. Not just about judgments granted. Have you found Isaiah 59 yet? This is how God defines justice. Isaiah 59 verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Skip down to verse 9. Therefore, justice is far from us. Our isolation, our iniquity, our isolation creates this injustice. Justice is far from us and righteousness does not overtake us. We hope for light and behold darkness. For brightness, but we walk in gloom. We grope for the wall like the blind. We grope like those who have no eyes. We stumble at noon as in the twilight. Among those in full vigor, we are like dead men. We all growl like bears. We moan and moan like doves. We hope for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. Skip down to verse 15. The Lord saw it. And it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak according to their deeds so he will repay. Wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies, To the coastlands he will render repayment, so they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun, for he will come like a rushing stream which the wind of the Lord drives. Injustice happens because our iniquities, our sins, have removed us from God's presence, and he, and he brings justice into the world when he brings his presence when he enters our brokenness, when he enters our rebellion, when he enters our sin, he brings justice with him. And that's the only way it comes. Justice isn't about legislating. It's not about organizing. It's not about structuring the world according to our sense of fairness. It's not about structuring the world according to our sense of right and wrong. Justice only comes when God enters the sin and brokenness of this world and brings more than solutions to our problems. More than solutions to our problems, he brings himself and his presence. God will not stand removed from the world. He will not stand aloof from its problems. He is not content merely to raise awareness by tweeting hashtags or dumping ice water on his head. You're going to let me get away with that? It's okay to raise awareness, I'm saying. As long as awareness leads to relationship. If awareness doesn't lead to relationship, then it's just self-serving. Justice will not come to this world apart from relationship to God. It can't. He defines what justice is. And because God defines justice by his presence, he does not need to adhere to our sense of what fairness should look like. It is the work of his hands alone. It's how he resolves everything that's broken with this world, how he transforms everything that that fails, how he restores and reconciles everybody who is cast far off. It's how he resolves the forces that keep us from believing that he is active in this world, the hardness of our hearts that refuse to listen to his wisdom, the sins that separate us from his nearness, 
and ultimately the desire to give God the honor he is due because he is worthy. He resolves all of that brokenness with his presence and his justice. God will enter our world and by his hands remake it. But Isaiah points to the truth here. He gestures to this, that the armor God's hands take up does not protect him from bearing the wounds of that injustice. His salvation helmet and his righteousness breastplate allow him to suffer the injustice of this world. Read on to verse 20. This is how that whole section ends. God will do all these things. How will he do them? Verse 20 says, and a redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgression, declares the Lord. It is that redeemer who will bear the injustice of this world. It is that redeemer who will enter our world of pain, who will do the ultimate act of unfairness. He will bear the weight of the sins of his enemies. He will take on their wrath. And everything that God had bestowed on his enemies has now been given to Christ. And not only will he call that justice, but he will call his enemies instruments of justice. This is how Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 5. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness, you can insert the word justice, same Greek word, two different English translations, we might become the justice of God. The hands of justice, God's hands by which he's remaking the world, God's hands of justice are wounded. They are scarred. And those wounded hands remake this world where the broken and the guilty and the sinners are transformed by his power into instruments of his justice, empowered by his presence to become like Christ, to become, as the writer Henri Nouwen calls them, calls us, wounded healers. All of us. All of us in this room bear the scars of the sins of other people. This guy up here too. All of us bear wounds because others did wrong. And only the God whose very presence is justice can enter our pain and transform those scars into the ability to bring healing to other people. When these things happen to us, we would cry out, unfair. We'd be right. And we would do everything in our limited power to try to insulate ourselves from our brokenness, apply ample coats of whitewash, trying desperately to cover up our wounds. But the more we do that, the more we hide ourselves from our brokenness, the more we hide ourselves from the wounds of the sins of other people, we unknowingly disconnect ourselves from the transforming justice of God and any ability that we have to be of real help to those who are truly suffering in this world. When South Africa was trying to heal after generations of racial apartheid, Uh, Nelson Mandela established what they called the Truth and Reconciliation Committee. And the Truth and Reconciliation Committee was was there to provide justice for victims of oppression, a place for people to come and share their stories, and a place for people to find healing. And so they wondered who should serve on some kind of committee, some kind of group like this. And so they asked Bishop Desmond Tutu, who the kind of person that that Bishop Tutu would recommend should serve on this committee, could listen and, and provide healing for people. And Bishop Tutu's advice was, 
that the committee should be made up of the victims of that racial oppression. But not people who are arrogant, not victims who are self-serving, not those looking for vengeance, no. They should only offer positions on the committee to those who have what they called the authority of awful experiences. I kind of like that phrase. The authority of awful experiences. These are the people who have the ability to empathize. These are the, pil- the people whose, whose hearts are willing to forgive. These are the people who can be the wounded healers of the nation. We would do everything in our power to avoid the painful confrontation of who we have been and what has been done to us. But as Henri Nouwen writes in his, in his little book called The Wounded Healer, we must protect and even in some way cherish that brokenness. To come to an awareness, as painful as that is, that our brokenness does not isolate us from God's presence, but is an invitation from God to truly be empty before him, that he could fill us with his power, he could fill us with his blessing, he could fill us with his justice. I think the Apostle Peter would agree with that. Let me remind you what Peter says in 1 Peter 3, verse 14. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, or can I say it this way, if you should suffer for justice's sake, you will be blessed. These hands, our hands, are empty. They are incompetent. They are broken. They are scarred. But the hands of justice are wounded. And now only wounded people can change the world. Only wounded people can bring his healing. Only wounded healers know the difference between suffering and inconvenience. Only wounded healers can give more than textbook answers to life's challenges. Only wounded healers can have the strength not to retaliate. Only wounded healers can, like God, enter the people's brokenness and bring something more than Christian platitudes. Bring something more than hashtag activism. And only wounded healers know that presence is a whole lot more important than answers. And that we might never understand why these terrible things happen to us. I'm not suggesting for a minute I understand why these things happen to us. But that God's presence will redeem even the meaninglessness of suffering. That what others intended for evil, God intended for good. Only wounded healers really know, really know, that God is just. So here's what I want you to realize today. I don't know what's happened to you in the past. I'm not mind reader. I'm kind of glad for that. I don't know the secrets of your past that you're keeping from everybody else. I just want to prepare you. We're about ready to go into a month of talking about sexual brokenness. And a lot of stuff's going to come out. But this is what I do know. All those things in your past you think should disqualify you from ministry are the very things that, transformed by God's justice, empower you for real ministry. And these are the kinds of servants we need in the world. These are the kind of wounded healers we need in the world surrounded by justice everywhere we go from the domestic violence situation happening in the apartment above you to the oppression, exile, and execution of Christians in Iraq. How are we supposed to, what are we supposed to do with all this? Our hands are empty, they are weak, they are incompetent, they are broken, but the hands of justice are wounded. So don't underestimate for one minute the transforming power of one small act of justice done in the name of Christ. Remembering that God brought justice into the whole world with one small act. A lot of you know Lance and Tara Schaubert. They just a few months ago moved to Brooklyn. 
uh, New York to work with Orchard Group uh, there, planting churches. And uh, Tara used to work for Krista Weld in the missions office, and Lance is a freelance writer, um, kind of freelance hipster too. Um, I love Lance. He posted something on his Facebook page on Sunday. I got permission, so we're good there. <laughs> Let me just read you what he wrote. He's a lot better writer than I am. Privilege. To have a chance to break up a soon-to-be case of domestic violence between a guy and his girl as she cradled her baby. To have that chance, act on it, and save all three from a really stupid choice. This morning, a fistfight turned assault, broke out between two homeless guys in the park. It was early, like 6 a.m., and ain't nobody got time for that at 6 in the morning. That's how Lance talks. <laughs> Several of us stood by and watched. An older, an older fixture of the neighborhood was doing his typical pre-run stretches at the top of a hill. When he followed our collective gaze toward the action, he then acted immediately, shouting, Yo! Like a war cry. Like a direct challenge to those brawling below. The man who was repeatedly punting the down man in the ribs noticed that the older gentleman had seen everything that happened. Noticed the rest of us who witnessed his violence and he backed off. Employed the same strategy tonight with the, girl, with the guy and his girlfriend. Simple yell, firm, yo! And a steady stare to let this guy know that I know he saw me. Tons of adrenaline followed and I'm thankful it didn't escalate. But I couldn't stand there and let him toss around that lady and her infant. The shout worked, strangely enough. Didn't have to employ other methods and I'm grateful for that, for everyone's sake. You live and you learn, they say. This morning I was a passive activist. That's living. Tonight I was an active pacifist. That's learning. There is a difference. And I hope to grow into that difference as I age like the old man of the hill who just this morning asserted peace upon violence. Let me give you a little context. For those of you who don't know Lance, I could fit about two and a half of him in this jacket. <laughs> so it's not like... Uh, he physically intimidated the guy. But that's the action of somebody who trusts in the power of a just God to work in the smallest of actions. So don't for one second underestimate the power of one small act of justice. And lastly, don't underestimate the power of one small prayer. For a just God to transform even the largest of unjust situations, like a lot of you I've been following as best as I can, the plight of Jesus' followers in Iraq, homes marked with the Arabic noon, which marked the followers of the Nazarene, thousands forced into exile, becoming refugees, many executed, men, women, even children. Reports have that many women are being sold into sex slavery. It's difficult to know what's true and what's not. But Christians are being oppressed and being persecuted and being killed. How do we respond to that? We respond knowing that the presence of God is justice. And that God enters the brokenness of their world, sharing their burden, the power of transformation. So what do we do? We pray. We do not cry out like children. It isn't fair. Because those believers, here's the, here's the incredible thing. Those believers suffering for the cause of Christ have already found true justice. In the hope beyond all hope. The justice of the day which all violence will cease. But until that day, we pray. We pray for the wounded church. And we do that because we know that by his wounds, we have been healed. And we also know that by our wounds, others might find healing in him. And realize for the first time what justice really, truly is. Let's pray for our brothers and sisters in Iraq, and then we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you. We do not understand why these things happen. We can't comprehend the evil that exists in some men's hearts to cause such suffering and to enjoy such suffering. But 
we feel helpless. We feel completely incompetent to it, to do anything that matters with something as large as this. And so we pray, Lord, we need you to work. We've always needed you to work. We need you to do something that we can't understand or comprehend or explain. We need you to enter into refugee camps and to bring boldness to people to preach the good news of Jesus Christ that in the midst of their helplessness that there is really truly hope in you. We need you to transform lives like you did of Saul on the road to Damascus. We need, we need you to, to bring dreams and visions. We need you to speak into people's lives and to, for the very first time to see just what their sin is causing in this world. We need you to supernaturally protect those who need protection. We need you to establish their hearts and to enable them to endure. We need you to to help us be creative in how we can share the burden and and bear those wounds of our brothers and sisters. Help us to, to imagine ways in which we can do that work and share that pain for them. Most of all, Lord, we, all of us, need a clearer picture of you. We need a clearer picture of your son. We need a greater willingness to enter into the pain around us and bring your healing. We thank you, Lord, that by your, by your wounds, we are healed. In the name of the wounded healer, we pray. Amen.